All right, let's call the Committee of the Whole to order. Um, let's note that uh, all members of the committee are present, um, minus Councilman O'Malley, um, who's not able to join us this evening, as well as uh, plenty of members of the administration, um, and I'm sure others we will be introduced to uh, momentarily. Um, I'll make a motion first to approve the minutes of our April 11th meeting. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes. And with that, I'll turn it over to Director Leininger for the moment, and then we'll, we'll move from there. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of council. Um, so before we get going this evening, I just want to put up our schedule uh, that we had set out uh, when we set these initial three meetings. I know there's been some conversation about potentially adding a fourth meeting, and I believe we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on uh, before we break for the regular meeting. Uh, but here this evening, we're here to talk about the different project components, uh, ranging from the resident from the residential use, the Curtis block, the ground floor retail, the community space, and the parking garage. And then uh, at your next meeting on, on April 25th, we'll, we'll pick up any items that we don't get to this evening. Uh, but then we'll also have representatives from Roundstone here um, uh, to talk about the office component. Uh, and we won't necessarily take them in this order, but we're, our, our goal is to, to talk about these different elements today. We also want to talk about uh, some of the financials or continue the conversation about the financials. Um, as part of your, some of the questions that we've received from a couple of council members, uh, there's some continued questions about the density of the project. Uh, there's also some questions about just the, the general financials um, related to, to that. And they all are, it's, it, they're all tied together. When we talk about density, we talk about cost, we talk about incentives, we, we talk about parking. Um, so we, we have some additional information we'd like to share this evening. All of the information that's going to be put on the screen, um, it was requested I send that in advance. Uh, I apologize I couldn't do that sooner, but I, I did send it out to you about an hour before the meeting started. Um, so you have everything at your disposal uh, via an email from me. So with that, we do have a lot of the same faces that we had here um, at the last meeting. There are, there are two new faces I'll recognize. Um, uh, Colby Turnock is the Vice President of Development for Casto. He's going to uh, really help lead us through the site plan, I think, exercise, um, or be part to, to answer the questions related to that. Um, and we also have um, uh, Ken Kalinchuk, who is with PMC. He's a project director. Um, as you know, Tracy's been at a lot of the meetings with us. Unfortunately, Tracy isn't feeling as well this evening. Ken has been involved in this project from day one alongside Tracy and, and knows this project uh, as, as, as well as anybody in the room. Uh, so we value uh, his input here this evening to answer any questions that you may have. So with that, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to give this really the opportunity is here for, for you to hear from Casto and North Point Realty. Uh, we also have a members of, of Scott Dimmitt and Dimmitt Architecture and their team. You'll hear from them as well. Um, uh, but I'll hand it over to them and we can we can jump into the to the discussion this evening. Thanks, Sean. Uh, and, and as Sean pointed out, I think what we'd like to do is kind of walk through the site, kind of go use by use, um, starting uh, with the plaza and kind of working our way uh, maybe counterclockwise to the south and, and finishing up on the Curtis block. Um, and then go into uh, some of the financials on the previous version that we kind of touched on last week, but provide some color because I know some questions were, were asked of that. So um, this is a massing study uh, showing the plan uh, as it sits today. Um, and I'm going to have uh, Scott Dimmitt kind of walk us through the building. Um, uh, this is all kind of conceptual at this point, but let, let's go ahead and move to the next slide, Sean, and, and start with some of the images there. Um, it, it's kind of hard to uh, see if we could zoom in, but the, the plaza space is, is really at, in a conceptual design at this, this standpoint, but the intent is to try to have the, the, the buildings framing the plaza so that we could have the, the users on the ground floor kind of interact with that public space so there's kind of that uh, cohesive feel between private and public, uh, but also have the space size so that it can accommodate many of the events that, that exist today in Lakewood. Um, so that was really the main goal, was trying to make sure we got the, the sizing right. Um, and you can see some, some concerts and events and the farmer's market, uh, also having some images there in the top right, what this may look like at night, uh, assuming you've, you've kind of got a restaurant user there on the left-hand side. 
Um, so the building in, in the on the bottom right side, that would be the Roundstone uh, office building that we're referencing. Um, so maybe turning it over to Scott and let him go into and speak to the office building, which would be the next slide, I believe. Or no, nope, there was one more plaza slide there. Hello. Um, uh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm Scott Dimmitt from Dimmitt Architects. Um, uh, we're a Lakewood firm and have been uh, located across the street from this site for the last 15 years. So uh, we're uh, very excited and honored to be uh, taking a part in the, uh, the development. Um, I think this is a good place to start because we really think that the uh, the plaza is really the heart of the project. It's uh, 18,500 square feet, so it's it's almost the size of a, a full office floor plate in the uh, the corner building. Um, we uh, are working with a, a great company that we've worked with in the past, uh, Edge from Columbus, and they are going to be uh, uh, really coming up with some fantastic ideas for the public spaces, the streetscapes, uh, landscaping. So a lot of the, the images you see here are uh, uh, works in progress by that group, and uh, by no means are they completed, but they give you kind of a flavor of what the, uh, the intentions are. Um, but to uh, Brent's point, I think uh, the 18,500 square feet, uh, our goal is to really make that as flexible and uh, as accommodating to as many different types of uh, events that could be held there. Um, I think the scale of it is, uh, is also a critical element. Uh, currently, the, the building um, that you can see on the left, uh, that's the four-story office commercial building. Uh, there's three levels at 20,500 square feet each um, for, for lease office professional space, and two floors uh, are currently already spoken for by uh, Roundstone, as you know, from our last meeting. The ground floor is a little bit smaller. I believe we're at... Uh, 13,500 square feet for commercial space. And uh, the building on, that you can see on the far right is also a, um, um, an apartment building that would have commercial use at the ground level. And we'll talk a little bit more about that because that ties into the Curtis block a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, but the thought is to get as many sort of active commercial uses to activate the plaza. And uh, uh, just to the left here where you see the arcade, that's, that's sort of where the entry to Roundstone is. So you'll have uh, 150 or more employees kind of coming back through the plaza to that entry or coming from the uh, garage behind that. Um, let's move to the next slide. So uh, again, these are conceptual, and uh, but I think there, there's some nice uh, ideas that are going on in terms of uh, the goals for the, uh, the overall project uh, that we've kind of taken to heart. Um, this building would probably be the more modern and more um, uh, sort of urban building out of the entire uh, siting. Um, which, what we're looking at here are sort of three-story expressions of uh, glass and aluminum infill spandrels uh, framed in, in masonry. And masonry is going to be a theme conceptually that you'll see through all of these buildings. We think it's a great way to tie into the, the history of downtown Lakewood. Um, we've mixed that up with some other more contemporary materials, but uh, the ground floor is sort of recessed. Uh, and that's where you know, that commercial lease space would come into play there. Uh, I know that uh, Casto and uh, North Point are talking to a number of different uh, potential anchor tenants for the lower levels. But, uh, and above that is Class A office space, uh, nice L shapes. And uh, we have a, at the uh, southwest corner, there's a sort of an outdoor um, space for the, for the office users themselves that Brown sounds really excited about using. Um, Let's uh, go to the next slide. So I think the way we'll talk about this is um, really starting at the south. And uh, the overall concept in terms of just how the buildings have been designed, those would be the, the least dense buildings. Um, there's two small for sale products currently. 
uh, fronting bell, and those are literally just uh, almost identical to the, the fabric that's there now. Uh, single family homes with a detached garage in the back. And uh, uh, the idea is to sort of make that transition gradually as, as we go further south. So uh, the buildings immediately north of those two for sale products, um, they are three story walk up uh, apartment buildings. And uh, the thinking for those would be that they're double sided. So there would be uh, apartments facing, uh, on, in this case, looking out on Marlowe and then also looking into an interior courtyard. There are 24 apartments in each of those um, blocks. So there's two of them, one on Bell, one on Marlow. Uh, so there's 48 apartments, uh, market rate. Um, the majority of the apartments uh, in, in the overall mix here of 204 are, are one bedrooms. And uh, that would be about 60 to 70% of those. Uh, the remainder being two bedroom uh, studio and uh, a few three bedrooms. Um, the thought for, the, for the, uh, the buildings, which I'll call three and four here, is that they would be the, the ones where we can really start to look at the, uh, the history of uh, Lakewood residential buildings. So, uh, and this isn't it yet, but we're starting to kind of, you know, explore the idea of roof dormers at the top that you would see in some craftsman homes, uh, front porches on, on literally all of the uh, buildings in this block, um, and then potentially stepping back the top a little bit to, to bring the scale down closer to a, a two and a half story, three story home. Um, I think that there's plenty of room as far as just the overall site to, to do really nice uh, yards at the front to kind of get some calming, uh, nice sidewalk and streetscapes and we're just sort of starting to hint at that here. Um, in between the two buildings, there's a private drive that, that uh, basically connects uh, Marlowe and Bell and um, that also will be a, a kind of a connector for the people that are parking in the garage to be able to get into these uh, various apartment buildings. So uh, maybe the next slide. So, so this is showing building two. So as that transition from uh, you know, a, a smaller single family uh, neighborhood network kind of uh, moves forward towards Detroit, uh, this middle building has 70 apartments. Um, it's basically four stories built at grade, and it's um, immediately sort of fronting the, the parking garage behind it. Uh, there's, if you can see, there's that little slot of uh, kind of dots there. Uh, each of the lower level uh, apartments there will have your own sort of private courtyard up against the uh, one and a half story facade of the garage there. So it'll be nicely landscaped. Um, it's a double loaded corridor building also with an elevator. So there'll be uh, uh, basically apartments fronting out onto Marlow, as you see here, and then facing uh, back over the garage and on the, uh, uh, the west side. And uh, both of these buildings, uh, building one, which is the one that uh, extends north to Detroit, and building two, they're both entered uh, at this corner. So basically that's a point where the slopes come together in such a way that if you're in a, in a wheelchair, you can get into each, each of the buildings there readily and also access the garage. Um, the top floor of this building is also uh, anticipated as being kind of pulled back, uh, sort of like penthouses, but uh, that'll be a full level of apartments up there. It's just um, those of you that toured the Dexter uh, saw that same sort of approach. It kind of brings the, the height of the building down a little bit and makes those, uh, those top apartments a little bit more special. Um, the materials that we're showing here, again, just conceptually a mix of bricks, um, uh, probably types of siding, um, uh, in this case, we're showing a little bit more traditional sort of clabbered siding on that penthouse at the top. And uh, nice windows, a, a little bit more open than the expression that was in the uh, buildings three and four. And then, uh, let's, can we go to the next one? And so, so this is showing um, building one. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more uh, with the guys about the, uh, the intersection with the, uh, the Curtis block, but uh, as it's drawn currently, it's uh, one level of commercial space, which extends into the base of the uh, footprint of uh, the Curtis block, and then there's four levels of apartments above it. Um, this building is kind of making more of a transition to the, the flavor of the, uh, the front office building, and also uh, a little bit more of the sort of commercial scale of uh, historic Detroit. Uh, it's a little bit similar to the kind of fabric you have over at Warren in Detroit. And uh, uh, in this particular study, we're, we're kind of showing outdoor um, porch areas, um, 
uh, different types of paneling. It almost has kind of a terracotta flavor to it, like it might have been an old uh, uh, historic department store. Um, but something that's a little bit more varied, and uh, um, we think it has a nice fabric flavor uh, added to the street. And uh, you, you want to take it from there? Okay, yeah. this is just showing some footprints of that same building, and the guys will talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so this, uh, as Scott pointed out, it, it is the footprint of what we're calling uh, Building 1, uh, which ties into uh, the Curtis Block facade. Um, so you can see kind of the uh, general footprint of, of where the Curtis Block, and Sean, if you could kind of hover over where that, uh, so as you can see on level two, three, four, and five on the left side of the screen, it shows the unit count that is kind of stacking over uh, the facade uh, that is being proposed uh, in this scenario to, to just save the facade. So in many of the previous versions we've, we've looked at and studied over the last year, um, it allowed us to gather a lot of information on this um, this building. So uh, if you go to the next slide, what we had studied previously was a full uh, save. And this kind of shows what is left. So on the right side, you'd have uh, level one, which would have five roughly 1,100 square foot spaces. So the walls there are, are required structurally to support the building. So we would have those five spaces. The building then would have to be stepped back, building one, uh, to have some separation between the two buildings. And then if you go to level two then under the full save, you would end up with about five residential units uh, in that building on the second floor. And then obviously nothing on the third, fourth, and fifth. So ultimately what that would yield is roughly a 32 unit loss in total um, and about 2,200 square feet of less commercial space. But probably the biggest thing uh, from our standpoint would be the commercial space that is left. So. If you look at the commercial space on the right-hand side here, um, and if we were to save the building in full uh, up in the Curtis block, so you, you'd have space that I'd pretty much consider not dynamic, not leasable, or leasable at a, a, an extremely discounted rate relative to new space that could tie into this large plaza investment that then we ha we'd be left with a new space of roughly 8,800. So our largest commercial space goes from 17,000 down to 8,800. Um, and I can say we are already in preliminary talks with some people that are looking in that 10 to 12,000 square foot range. Um, and that would preclude them from being in this particular building. Um, so maybe if you flip back to the previous slide, Sean, just so you can get a feel of what I just described there. And I think the other component, um, and it may, maybe if we go into the financial picture and that kind of loss of revenue standpoint, um, to save the, the Curtis block, we're looking at, I think it's the other, yeah roughly $7 million in cost. Um, if we were to get state historic tax credits, federal historic tax credits, I'd, we could yield maybe $2.5 million net, uh, maybe a little more. But to me, the biggest factor we'd be losing is the lost revenue of the 32 units. Um, I plugged in $20 a square foot on the commercial on the 2,270 square feet of lost commercial space and just kind of looked at it over a 30-year period. So not only is it the upfront cost, but it's the ongoing revenue loss. Um, and I think just what we're trying to accomplish and collectively, I think, with the plaza and the public space, um, 
I don't think that interaction with that building and, and I don't think that creates that dynamic space that, that we're trying to accomplish with the, with the public. So that is the Curtis block. I think uh, we spoke last week about some of the previous site plans and previous versions we studied over uh, the last year and a half with the advisory panel. Um, go, let's go to the site plan. Um, this is the, the first plan that I referenced um, last time, um, and this was Yeah, maybe the table, or maybe we can just, because it kind of describes it. So building A was the 10-story mixed-use office, hotel, conference center. Preserved the Curtis block. Stepped down to a four-story apartment. This had all of the parking underground, which is kind of hatched in the blue dotted line. Building C was a five-story apartment. Building E was six story, building B 12 story, and, and then as we stepped down in the site, we had more for sale townhomes on the back half. Uh, we continued with the same uh, single family. Um, I don't know if you have those massing studies, Sean. Second one. Yeah. So that gives you a, a sense of the density that we started at. Um, and then there were iterations off of this. Uh, but the kind of subsequent site plan that, that transitioned to, um, if you want to jump back, if you want to do the same exercise. So then we looked at changing the building types like we had discussed last week um, and brought down the, the scale of, of some of those building types. Um, and you, you see still preserving the Curtis block. Um, and all of these exercises were, were priced with the, the contractors to, to get to um, some real-time pricing. Uh, and then we, so that building scaled back to five-story from 10, I think, in the last version. That stayed at four story. Uh, then we went from 12 to eight, which took us from a cast in place building down to light gauge. Um, we continued with eight, six, seven, and there's kind of some rhyme and reason with each of those as it relates to building type. Um, we maintained the 24. Uh, walk up townhomes, and then if you go to the other massing iteration, that'll give you a sense of the, the same step down version here. Um, first one, yep. Eight. So then from a pricing standpoint, I think there's a, a question on kind of comparison and uh, just put this together at a very high level. That first version was around 160 million in cost. There was a $50 million gap. We didn't think that made very much sense. Um, took a step back, again, same thing, by bringing the building heights down. Uh, we were able to close the gap, but then just not significant enough. Um, and then there were many iterations off of these plans. Um, to try to put the pieces of the puzzle together as best we could. Um, and ultimately, we kind of landed on this current plan, which got to a, a gap that, as, as we mentioned last week, we think is, is solvable and also think it's a plan that we could execute on. Um, I put together, I think there was a question on kind of how this looks from a cost per square foot, cost per space, um, and, and outlined that there on the side. Um, I think these are 
big numbers from a cost per square foot, but unfortunately that's kind of the reality of the world we're living in right now. And I, I think it's only probably gonna get worse. Um, so I think from our standpoint, again, we've looked at this a lot of different ways over the last year and a half, and we're kind of at a point where we think this is a this plan, knowing we've got a lot of input still to receive, uh, particularly on the design, is something that, that we could execute. Um, but also just kind of full disclosure, like we've been from the beginning, is there's a lot going on in the market. There's a lot of cost pressure. There's interest rate pressure. Um, this is getting harder and harder, so. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, this presentation and being back here today and um, taking time with our questions. I know you've all been looking at this every which way from sideways, but it's a lot for us to take in and everyone joining us tonight, I think everyone's taking it in. So we, we asked the same things three times. I apologize, but uh, you know, just making sure we're all understanding. So, um, so you mentioned you estimate about $7 million if we were to, to just save the Curtis block, not, not including lost revenue, but just the yes. process of saving it, right? Yep. So, um, and, and I know you've had several different plans, but if you were to, let's say we removed the, Cur the Curtis block from the equation, someone else saves it later, that saved $7 million would be, how would that, potentially work to um, switch into more density in another area, perhaps with the steel. I understand that changes materials. I mean, did you guys look at that or what, what are some of your thoughts about that? So my uh, reaction, what we're carrying right now and all the numbers we've shared is $2 million to save the facade. So if the Curtis block stays in its current configuration and it's dealt with into the future, um, my initial reaction would be, uh, I'm not sure how that attract that would be very attractive to us um, from the stance, stance of trying to create this space with this kind of unknown piece sitting there that is a very focal piece that is tied and connected to everything. Um, I don't think that would be a good solution from our standpoint. Um, could we repurpose the $2 million in another piece and enhance something else, yes, that's definitely uh, something we could do uh, to answer that piece of the question. Mr. Chair. Please. If I could, I'd, I'd just echo what, what um, Mr. Sobchak said. And from the city standpoint, this is a planned development. Uh, we're looking at this holistically. Um, this is as much a front door to the site as the cast or as the the roundstone building is. It's as much a front door to the site as the as the community space is, and so it's important that it, it's all discussed together because they all play off of each other. They all need each other in order to to function both physically but also financially. Um, so I, I think it's important to to keep the curves block in the conversation as part of the overall development. Thank you. Any follow? Okay, Councilman Bullock. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and um, thanks, um, Mayor and Directors, and uh, Casto and team, Casto North Point Realty and team, and Dimit. Um, so, a couple things. First, thank you for uh, presenting tonight's information and options. I think, from our my perspective, I don't want to speak for colleagues. It's helpful to have the options. Um, I'm trying to get my hands around the opportunity cost of this path or that path or some third path that we haven't yet uh, thought of, but we hope to to work towards to kind of have the best of all worlds. Um, so even if we're hearing tough financial numbers, it's constructive to the debate, to the discussion, the deliberation to see, okay, here's <clears throat> the, the current assessment of path A, B, C, D, et cetera. Appreciate that. Second, um, uh, it's nice to get the elevations in the form they exist in to date for uh, the various buildings, the residential buildings that Dimmit showed, the very tasteful work. Um, I know that a lot of thought is, is 
put into that. And um, that's going to be a big, that'll have a huge impact on the personality of the overall development of how it adds character to our community, how it functions as a neighbor to the immediate neighbors and really the whole district. Uh, I'll repeat, as you've heard me probably say before, I'm hoping this will be an engine that drives downtown activity, other development, other reinvestment, et cetera. So what you do is a big deal. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that, but, but um, we appreciate the high quality and the future high quality work. Um, part of what's behind all my questions is, if we build something in six years, in 10 years, in 15 years, are we gonna have buyer's remorse for what we failed to include now or some other version of that same idea? It's, it's tricky, again, this is stuff that I'm sure developers and builders and designers deal with all the time, but we're, we're building a 50-year property based on today's moment. It's a snapshot in time where all these terrible things in the economy and the wars in Europe are affecting costs and we have to launch the development now or soon and it's gonna have a lasting impact well beyond the crisis of the moment. So I'm hoping that we can not let those limits limit the, the regenerative value to our community in every sense. Um, so that's a lot of the, the setup. But a um, couple, couple thoughts and questions. One is, you know, density in our downtown is a good thing. Density also helps us raise more tax dollars, whether from income tax, property tax, uh, shopping, you know, more visits. So uh, as we were showing the previous plans, I thought, man, I like those previous plans compared to uh, the, the mid-rise renderings that we're seeing in the current plan. Um, but but um, working to uh, make the site uh, do as much as it can is, is in my opinion, a, a pro. And, and I'm confident for the immediate neighbors that your good work to step buildings back and, and fit the context, we'll, we'll get that right. Probably the limiting factor is just how much risk does the, do, do you as our financial partners want to take on? How much um, co-investment can the city potentially muster? Um, and what are we willing to go for? And as you have heard me before, I want to swing for the fences on this, not hit a safe double or single. <laughs> um, so the, um, uh, on the uh, commercial conversation, it was helpful to know your analysis. Have you considered commercial tenants anywhere other than the current site of the, that front frontage on Detroit, the Curtis Block footprint? I know there's a single floor in the office, and are we talking uh, shops, restaurants, do we know yet? Could be anything. Um, it would be helpful to understand just the categories of use. I don't want to ask any confidential details. But I, I think what I'm hearing you say is that not all commercial space options are created equal, and you want to incorporate um, the best commercial sites into the space, couldn't some of the frontages on the public square, even though it's a private public square, also be A-list commercial? Yes, and, and that's what we have in the current plan. Okay. All, all ground floor spaces surrounding that plaza are intended to be kind of dynamic, whether it's restaurant, coffee, ice cream, uh, active users that would engage with that plaza. And uh, I'll just feel compelled to uh, comment. The, the hotel, the large numbers in the hotel analysis, pro is it fair to say those previous analyses would be for a national chain, a tower, a lot of parking spaces? I understand that those are filled routinely by business travelers who want to be close to the highway, et cetera. We're not, we would not be talking near term about that hotel model. We'd be talking about a small boutique. When my parents visit, when my, you know, cousin-in-laws, uh, you know, want to come to town. And um, 
we want to remain on good terms with them, so we find them a non-guest room situation, a boutique, small, our, our conversation. 24 people, you know. Um, I think the 100 to 120 key uh, plan is what we had, uh, which kind of fits into that boutique category. Um, and that is all of our conversations with the hotel operators have been in that boutique segment. Um, and that's where they felt the market would want to be from a hotel flag standpoint. So is that included in some of the some of the previous plans. The previous plans, but not the current plan. Correct. Okay. But the previous, the, the numbers you showed in the previous two plans had 100 lar large numbers for the hotel. I thought that was beyond it was boutique. 120. It was 120 in the first one and 102, I think, in the second one. Are those rooms or guests or what? They, they, the rooms. rooms. They call them keys. Okay. <clears throat> but that, that's not a boutique. 100? Yeah. Talking mini boutique. <laughs> I think that okay. just become right. more inefficient. I understand. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Rader. Thank you once again for coming out and regaling us here and, and providing this information. I, this process has been great so far, so thank you for also answering our questions um, along the way as we've had them. Uh, you know, there's overall, I, I really do like this design. I like the scale. You know, this is my neighborhood right on the block from where I live. I can almost see this from my house. I can walk a couple doors down and I can see it. So, you know, I'm excited about this project overall. I think the two rubs I have still are the Curtis block. You know, if we're gonna, there's two things that I can sort of really get behind when it comes to public subsidies towards something. It's affordable housing and it's historic preservation. So, I mean, even if it requires more than what we've sort of allotted, I think that's worth continuing to consider. Um, whether we separate it or not, I do believe it should be done at the same time. It makes a lot of sense as part of this project. We want to make a comprehensive project as attractive on whole. I think once that building's restored, it'll be magnificent. Right now, it's not magnificent, <laughs> but I think once it is magnificent, uh, you know, back to its former glory, we'll understand and we'll see that that was a, the right choice down the road. So that's the first thing. The second thing, and you know, tell, tell me if I'm alone, council colleagues, in this, but. Um, I really did find attractive about the, about the Carnegie uh, plan. The one thing I found really attractive about it was the, the corner public square lot. You know, we don't have a public square really here, except for like with the Marks Plaza Park there, which is not a phenomenal public uh, square, a centerpiece. And I think this, this could provide a really good opportunity to have that as a corner sort of park. I don't know. I mean, I've heard that that's really not the, the current thinking with planning. You don't usually put a, a park or a public place in a corner anymore. It should be held down by a building, right? I've heard that. But I mean, this is a once sort of in a lifetime opportunity to, to cut ourselves out, carve ourselves out, you know, that public space that could be a, a big Christmas tree in the, you know, in the wintertime, all kinds of events and things there. I really want to start to try to wrap my head around why we're not thinking about that park being on the corner. Again, maybe I'm alone. Maybe this is just the way that things go these days. We put public space in the middle of these projects instead of on corners. But um, that's the two things that I really, um, I suppose, w would like to see changed or, or addressed through this process. So thank you. Mr. Was there any response on the plaza placement? I just wanted to see if there was any additional comment on that. So and certainly I'll, you. I'll let Casto and, and Dimmit walk through uh, their thought proce process on the plaza. But as you've heard me uh, profess on, on different meetings about how do you how do you hold a corner uh, in a downtown and, and good planning practices, you hold that corner with a building because you want to give that that sense of density and scale. Uh, when you start to think about open space, and you also want to think about how you can engage and program those spaces. And so when it is on a corner, uh, you lose two sides of that to be able to program it. And so what are we what are we looking at in, in this case? or across from our, one of our busiest commercial corridors or our busiest commercial corridor in the city, which is Detroit, uh, which has lots of road noise, traffic, buses, other things that just aren't really attractive to, to sit next to or in front of. And then across the other street, we now have the community, the family health center in ER with patients going in and out. Um, it's, versus putting an interior to the site, which is how it's being shown here, we can really kind of build off of the scale and energy and density that, that's around it. Um, and begin to now take all those different spaces. And so to Councilman Bullock's point, I'm gonna zoom in here really tight just so I can show you an image. Um, now we can take 
everything forward of this line of the site all the way around and engage with this space. You can't do that when it's on the corner. Because um, all of this, as, as Mr. Sobchak alluded to, all of this north of about this, there's a, there's a line right here where this is a lobby serving the residential area. Everything north of here is commercial space. This is the arcade, the front door for the, for the office user. This is their lobby. Uh, and then they go up to the second floor. And then the balance of this is, is retail and commercial space. So it's very different energy. It's, a very, it's, it's, it's just a very different way to approach it. So We have the same opinion, and, and I think our, our planning team does as well. And I don't have anything to add on that. I agree 100%. Yeah, I mean, this is really off the cuff, but, but uh, I hadn't really truly considered a plaza on that corner with the health center and ambulances and the like uh, pulling in and out and, and, and things like that. It's really not something I hadn't considered. It's, I suppose. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, I mean, uh, that is my position. I'd, I'd like to talk more about this, but I, I agree with Mr. Rader that the corner is... We want this to invite the public in. Right now, um, I need to learn a lot more about how it's done. In terms of sound management, you've got it in a canyon right now. Throwing up some trees may not mitigate that. So I mean, just just this is a major point for continued discussion. I think it can be successful either way, but um, I, I, I don't want to concede any any point on this yet. Thanks. Mr. Oh, sure. I was I was merely pointing out. That might be a consideration whether it's across the street, certainly. Mr. Chair. And then we'll go to Councilman Baker. Yes, Great. go ahead. Um, well, while we're talking about the community space and the placement, um, and some of the questions I had sent in, um, this is one of the things I talked about, and less about the placement, but I think it goes back to what is, what is the purpose of the community space, what do we mean by programming. So what I'm hearing, and of course, you know, you guys got to, you have to, get your money out of it, right? So, and like, and so do we. So like, that all makes sense. But if we're thinking programming in terms of outdoor dining for um, the commercial venues there and some of the other commercial purposes, um, you know, Director Leininger, I see your point about, you know, you don't want to dine there or whatever. But if we're thinking programming, the way that I think of it as a nonprofit programmer who organizes events, I'm thinking in terms of inviting people in and with that sort of arcade-ish feel of like right now in the middle, and I and I understand um, to Mr. Dimmitt's point, like these are preliminary drawings, and um, but it does feel like an invitation would be an extra invitation would be needed. Whereas when it's more open, it's it's continuously inviting, and so I think that goes back to I do think we need to have some significant conversation. Like the form really needs to follow the intended function. Mm -hmm and um, like engaging with our community partners, like Lakewood Alive, like the Arts Festival, all the things we do. Um, I don't want to assume that they want to use this space, but I think we need to think about what we as a community want to happen in that space. Is it mostly a public space that sometimes has private functions? Is it mostly a private space that sometimes, you know? Um, so I really feel like those conversations need to happen before we have a definitive design um, because the function will, if we need to determine those things before that function is completely assigned. So if it's intended to be a public square, it has a different, where we hold community events, it has a different feel than a private plaza that sometimes we have things on. So that's my two cents. Thank you, Council Member Keppel. Uh, Councilman Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> and thank you, uh, Brett and the team, and uh, Dimmit for uh, presenting tonight. A lot of helpful information. And I like. We'll we'll have more questions after I've uh, absorbed it all. Uh, and since we're on the topic of the kind of community space, uh, you know, I'm I'm probably like 51 percent in the on the corner. Um, and Councilman Rader and I were just discussing. There's not that many ambulances that go there. They kind of go up McKinley now by my house to Fairview, uh, so I hear them. Uh, but really interested in, in kind of what the, I think that's, we'll get there with the plan development process, right? Um, with planning commission, with ABR, uh, really interested in the public's input on it. Um, I see the commercial, um, you know, kind of business stake for having more sides, right? More, more access into it. Um, and so I think it's a push pull between private and public, right? And I think we have to find that right mix. Um, so I'm interested in the process. Um, 
on, on what was presented tonight, you know, I just, th there's two things um, that I kind of want to hit on, and one, one is the parking. Um, and I understand it's necessary, and I understand it's extremely expensive, right? Uh, $24,000 of space, that's, but that's what it costs to build a parking garage. Um, I think those are pretty good numbers. Now, you know, I would, and so that's 13 million bucks, right, roughly, uh, for the parking garage. Um, our obligation of the clinic is about 2 million of that, right, 1.8, uh, 2 million. So I'm just, and I, you know, the administration just sent a copy of kind of our lease with the clinic that says how we provide spaces to them. Uh, there is a large parking garage that seems to be underutilized on the north side of Detroit uh, that's current fair market value is under two million. Um, so it's just something to think about. Uh, and perhaps, you know, the folks that live here aren't going to want to cross Detroit, but perhaps the people that are on Detroit that work in the Family Health Center might. So just something I would like the administration, you may have already done so, would really be interested in an analysis on that because I think that that, you know, every space you cut down right, that's more money you can put elsewhere on the site. Uh, and one of the things with the parking garage, and I've expressed this uh, with the administration, is I think we need to, particularly with the marking conditions as they are today, we don't know what they're gonna be when actually caissons and, and foundations start going in in about a year. Uh, but I think we need to be able to leave this site so that we can get more out of it eventually. Uh, so we need to be really thoughtful about what we do today. Um, so when I look at a parking garage, you know, I see what was done downtown above pot bellies, right? They put a parking deck in, and it's, I, I'm not Pollyannish about this. I know it's going to take more money, right, to build a, a, a deeper foundation, uh, to build a parking garage that allows for vertical uh, construction above it. But I'd like to know what that is, what that cost is, right? Because um, I think we can, you know, we're talking about hotel. The marking conditions today for a hotel aren't there. Uh, but they may be in 10 years. Um, look what happened in downtown on Euclid where it was, Marking conditions for new build apartments weren't there when they built a parking deck, but then 12 years later, Stark built an apartment complex there, right, on top of the parking garage. So that's a lot more folks interacting and, you know, on Euclid and a lot more income tax revenue for the city. So it's something I think we should be very thoughtful about. And also kind of my lodestar as we go through this analysis, um, you know, are the important things that we've already talked about, like the Curtis Block, the community conversation around that. Um, is, is just remembering what was here and the income tax and economic driver that it was for the city. One to $1.1 million in income taxes um, was a tremendous driver for the city of Lakewood for almost 100 years, right? So I think we need to think about this site as the replacement of that, right? That econo economic driver. So right now we're in the six to seven hundred thousand dollars in income taxes uh everything we can do to push that up i think is our fiduciary duty as council people to 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 advocate for and i think that goes along with the density which is i think you know you have a 13-story building across detroit avenue understand the costs um you know but the, the more density you have the more people you have there uh you know the more economic vitality for the city so those are some of the things i'm going to be focusing on uh, and that was more of a soliloquy than a question, but I am actually interested in the developer's thought on the parking deck and what it would take to be able to go vertical above it. So, Mr. Chairman, we can Please. we can certainly dive into this to the extent that, that you, we, we need to get into it. Um, obviously, we've, from the what we shared here this evening, we, we looked at providing additional density onto the site. And as we provide additional density, the revenues that are all, the, the, the cost of providing that additional density aren't offset by the revenues. And so that gap just continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And those gaps that you saw include a tax abatement. They include the residential tax abatement. A TIF isn't going to cover that gap, even if it was 100% school TIF. Even if we were to, to, to apply for TMUD, which I think we've looked into TMUD, I don't know what this is really scores that, that great in a TMUD scoring um, scenario. So that could provide up an additional 10 million. So the only way to close some of these gaps is the city put some real hard cash into the project to the tune of tens of millions of dollars, but that, depending on which scenario you're looking at. Um, I certainly appreciate the conversation about how do we build for more density in the future. That does require deeper foundations. It puts us back into the groundwater, which the groundwater is a concern. Um, it also carries a cost with it. Um, that cost has to be carried by the development that's going in on day one, not the development that might come in year 20, might not ever come. 
Um, so all those are, 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 are healthy considerations, but at the end of the day, we're, 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 kind of, we're, we're, con we're constrained by what our, what our market can offer us, and our market can offer us, or will support about a 65,000 square foot office user. We'll support, a, a, we can probably, there's some opportunities we can probably increase the residential density on this site. Um, we're already kind of pushing the envelope on the, res on the retail side. Uh, we're a little bit above what our market study says that we could absorb before considering some of these other things. But I mean, at the end of the day, all of these, uh, more density doesn't, doesn't necessarily make this, this project better. Putting more incentives into it, well, sometimes on, on one hand, we're also hearing maybe the incentives might be a little too much, or how do we, how do we minimize the amount of incentives that are going into this? We, we have a lot of different things that are competing interest. Um, and so what we've tried to do is put together a, 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 a project that is balanced. It's physically, it's feasible. From the market standpoint, we believe it's feasible. Financially, with some assistance from the city in the form of some type of TIF, perhaps some assistance from the state on some grants and some other things, um, we think we can get there on this. And so as we start to now push and pull on those different things, I think it really starts to put some, some pressures on, on the margins on this project. Um, but I, I hear what you're saying. It's just there's, there's, there are some very real constraints on, on the project financially. Mr. Chair. Yeah, and, and so I, and I, that's, and, and I appreciate all the work that the administration has done because I can tell a lot of work has gone into this. Um, you know, but, but council uh, wasn't involved in that work, uh, to, to, at least I wasn't, right? I, I'm new. Um, but so this, you know, we're absorbing a lot and we have questions. And, um, and the one thing on the, on the parking garage in particular is what, what, what would it cost then to, to do that, right? Because there is money in the hospital fund, and I'm not saying we use it, but I'm saying that at least it'd be a healthy consideration to think about. Uh, and that's where I think just information would be good for a council to kind of make that consideration and talk to the administration about it to see if, you know, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? So, um, and, and it might not work, uh, but just I think it's something we should think about as we continue with this process. Certainly an area for which we may have leverage that we haven't considered, or, or if it has been considered, we want to understand that conversation to the extent it's happened. Um, so, go ahead. I would just add that we, we, have, we have had general conversations about the hospital fund, not when we were looking at these other scenarios. The hospital fund cannot close the gaps that are in the project on, on, a, on those other scenarios that we considered. Mm -hmm. It's not enough. Okay. Um, so then we have to find other sources, whether it's general fund, whatever, whatever it might be, and that's where it, it, it gets really hard okay. once we get beyond that. Yeah, and I, I guess my direct question is more so just like just the parking garage, what it would take. Um, and so am I hearing it's more than six and a half million? I don't know if Castle's looked into superstructure on a, on a parking garage to, to support additional building. We, we kind of considered that in the earlier scenarios. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the structure was part of the previous versions, but to, it, we'd have to reprice, hey, what, if we were to allow for that on the parking garage for say, what do we have to do structurally, foundation-wise, and so on? And we can get a, a delta for that number to, to answer your question. Uh, Mr. Th th thank you, because I think that, I, I mean, it, Director Leininger, I suspect you may be correct that it's just not feasible, but I think uh, it would be a delegate, uh, you know, uh, I think we should consider it. That's all I'm saying. And see how it pencils out, yeah. certainly. I, realizing that's a huge uh, upfront giveaway, so to speak, uh, but, but perhaps for the sake of the greater good, especially if market conditions were to improve or the like. And Mr. Chair, there's also ways to structure the air rights, right? So the city has some, some of the ownership of those, so that there's a future revenue source. So I mean, there's ways you can do it, but uh, I think just having the information would be helpful for us to consider it. I appreciate the question, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Keppel, please. Um, thanks. Um, I so following up just a little bit on parking garage. Um, I'm just going to put a pin yeah. in this: is that I'd love to see what steps might be incorporated to kind of offset the carbon footprint of that carbon garage. And I did see that there were plans to have EV chargers and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. Um, but I also wanted to ch um, also note uh, the public spaces with those that there were. It's not necessarily in the parking garage, but it's incorporated into the site. It was listed that there would be some 
you're both looking at me like I have lobsters crawling out of my ears. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it is in there, right? Did, it, am public, I? Public parking spaces? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. And so, <laughs> are, so are those in the parking garage or just somewhere on the site? They're in the parking garage. They're in the parking garage. Okay. And I'm assuming they would be like down at the base level so people could park and shop and whatever, or where do we have We any? have not gotten into okay. that level of detail um, where okay. it's located. All right. I'm just, I'm just thinking in terms of um, mostly accessibility for mm -hmm. people. And on, on that note, one of the other things was with the residential, and I appreciate um, Mr. Mitt talking about the entryway to between the two buildings. Um, having the right gradient, so thank you about that. Um, but I, in terms of mentioned about that there are a few three bedrooms, we talked about that a little last week, yep. um, in the three-story residential, I think you said, um, but are, is, are those, how many three bedrooms are we talking about, or has that been finalized, and where are they? I'm just concerned about, you know, we talked about last week about we have a lot of families that yeah. aren't able to stay in Lakewood. We, we have not finalized that. It's at a conceptual level. I think they're probably more programmed in the four and five story buildings and not the three story. Um, the, the two three story buildings in, in the south of the site uh, are primary, are about 50% ones and twos. Okay. And one of the, if I can continue, one of the other questions I had sent in was in terms of the residential, um, what, what it would look like um, for, uh, for some of the units to be, you know, built with um, accessible, um, ADA compatible, like, in, and what that does to the project is that being considered? I mean, obviously the lobbies and public spaces are, but in terms of the units. Yeah, I mean, we're required uh, for fair housing standards to have ADA units and, and accessible. Uh, so, like the elevators on the, the buildings as well, so. Right, but the but the units themselves, like for instance, having yes, the, yeah. yeah, the units themselves. There's a certain percentage that you have to meet. What what percentage is that, Dean? And then I just have a, uh, and we'll get to other council questions. I'm sure there are more. Um, just reviewing our minutes from our previous meeting, um, we were talking about a total project cost of 81 million, um, at least as I'm reading in, in our in our minutes. Yep. Um, I think I saw something different in the in the. Yep. It was just our cost. final version uh, shown. Yep. Here tonight. So if I could understand that discrepancy, I'd appreciate yeah. it. It's just hard cost. Um, I did it just from trying to get to more to this per square foot on hard cost because um, I think that was one of the questions that, that was asked, um, trying to get to the per square foot and per space number mm -hmm. so that those previous plans also were consistent on just hard cost. So it doesn't include like architectural, engineering, legal, accounting, interest, all the okay. other. So overall, 81 million is still 81 million. 81 million. This Our is just. Our cost is about 70. Yes. Okay. And the 81 backs out the office. Ah. That's why. Understood. Okay. That makes sense. Councilman Bullock, did I see a question? Or others? Did I not have No, no but if, if there's a chance, I, I, I have one. <laughs> I'll be uh, short. So uh, this is a fascinating discussion. Uh, a couple of thoughts that came to mind were, can you describe in layperson's terms the cladding? I'm trying to fit in with your architects here. The cladding and the materials, um, are they A, B, C tier, or you know, good, better, or best? Um, because as I've heard in the past, so this is a very nice design, the difference in the final finish or feel and quality and value can range pretty significantly depending on the materials used. Do you know the answer to that question yet, or you have a rough budget in, you know, uh, 
and target for what you're aiming for. Would you guys like to speak to the assumed material finish and the detail with it? Um, you know, and initially, and again, it's a kind of conceptual approach. We've been sort of defining the facades uh, for these sort of real-time pricing efforts, and we've, d we've done that a dozen times in the last year. Um, right now, we think the masonry product, you know, so basically just basic brick, uh, is a great material. It's got a historic uh, relevance. It's affordable. It's locally uh, sourceable. So, um, you know, I, I think it's... All materials, and let me correct that, all materials are not affordable right now. Uh, there's, there's nothing that's affordable. Uh, but, out of, you know, comparatively, brick is a good one. Uh, there, there's a number of different siding, cement products out there, uh, some more contemporary, some less contemporary, more historical. Um, and you can see we're kind of experimenting with a mix here. Uh, but um, one of the, the things that we love about working with Casto is that uh, inside of a, a given budget, the end product is always a great quality product. And, uh, you know, I think now more than ever, having a good team and working in real time in a design assist fashion with a, a good contractor like Alford is super critical. I mean, and that, that extends to everything. Uh, we have good quality windows. I'm not sure if, if all of you were able to visit the, uh, the wonderful Dexter project that we, uh, we worked on for Casto, but uh, uh, it, that's an example of a project that hits a, a very challenging price point and does it really well. I mean, I think that it really exudes a nice quality, and uh, I don't see any reason that the, the initial conceptual designs that we're showing here can't move in that direction. Okay, thank you. I think I, I follow that you've got a tightrope to walk to achieve the quality and still respond to real-time pricing, which has been as challenged as, as it's been in modern memory. Um, hopefully, breaks in friendly ways in the next 12 months, right? Um, did, have we described at all the, let's pretend for the minute that this is the plan we're going to build, we got approvals. Have we talked, discussed the sequencing of construction? Are you building everything all at the same moment or uh, is it one before the next before the next? I think initially the, the thought would be to build the office building in the garage first. Um, and kind of sequence yourself out clockwise, I guess it would be, uh, to allow for some staging area to the south south side of the, of the site. Um, but to circle back on your first question, and I, I think you were at Dexter, it's a good example of a, a brick selection that Dimmit uh, had, and we spent with our kind of owner's rep team and, and the contractor and Dimmit, we searched and searched and searched until we found the right brick. Um, so it's hard to say where it's gonna land, but I can promise you they're not going to select anything cheap, so we, we've got to go out there and find the right look and then find it in the right budget price, right? So it, it's a bit of an exercise, but I think what Dem is really good at is they participate fully in that exercise because they don't want to sacrifice their design or look uh, for a, a lesser quality material. So th they're fully engaged on that and, and very, uh, very supportive of the effort to get the look that they want. Too. So it, it worked out very well at Dexter. That's great. And my last question is that footprint for the parking garage is horizontally very large. Couldn't it narrow and yield more usable space to other elements, other buildings? And I'm predicting the answer is going to have something to do with cost, but uh, couldn't the, could there be a different sweet spot? And I'll let the, the design team chime in. I, I think if you sacrifice the width, you're probably going to increase the height, um, which has cost implications and implications on the impact of building two, uh, just from a, a view standpoint, and how that impacts those units facing west. Mr. Chair? Please. If, if, if Mr. Bullocks. Um, I, I just wanted to, um, going back to something that you said, um, regarding the um, landscaping, does uh, Edge, are they, do they have experience with sustainable landscaping or what are, what are the thoughts on the types of landscaping? You know, we talked about bioswales, maybe some, you know, wildflowers rather than grass, more trees, community gardens, just a personal thought for me. So um, if you could speak to the experience with that or the plans at all. Yeah, Edge has a lot of experience, not only kind of in, a, in an urban context, but an institutional context, so that they've done kind of the full gamut of 
applications. Um, so we're just kind of tip of the iceberg at that point. So there's a lot of more studies to do um, as far as how we treat the, the spaces in front of the buildings and between the buildings and the plaza. And I can speak to Edge as well. I spent 11 years working in Central Ohio and worked with Edge on multiple projects from things where we hired them as a city to, to help us do things, but then also working with them on the development side across the table. Um, they have a diverse experience. They, there's, there's not much, I, actually there's probably any, not anything they haven't done um, given their experience uh, and their, their stretch across the state, across other states as well. If I could, Please. I, I want to leave room for public comment. I don't know if people are signed in, but um, the, um, just one other point we were talking about density, I forgot to ask, um, looking at the, and I, I understand these are initial drawings and we'll come back to it, but the, um, the amenities building looks like it's a single story. Is there a thought of potentially going up there to add density? Yeah, that, that's one of the things we're studying right now to try to make that, for lack of a better, more of a U-shaped building uh, that, that may bring some more units um, and studying what we can do on the ground floor if, if necessary. Um, so. And then one, this is my last one. <laughs> and then, um, sure. yeah, right, for now. Um, and so then uh, also my other question was, um, have you considered with all the people living here and all the people coming here to shop and engage with this space, um, some sort of dedicated ride share area because so people aren't getting dropped off on Detroit and whatnot, that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I question. think uh, that is something we think about on all of our new projects now. I think there's some space uh, behind building A that would lend itself uh, to a good location there uh, and have a nice little turnaround. Um, so preliminarily, that's kind of what we're, where we're thinking. Thank you, uh, colleagues, for all your questions. Um, it's 7.13. Um, we had set off this meeting to talk about the Curtis Block a little bit, the garage, the community space, um, and some of the residential pieces. Um, I think we'll uh, allow for the next meeting to also cover some of those uh, uh, some of those things. I did want to, just on a housekeeping level, um, talk with colleagues about potential additional meetings other than those already contemplated and scheduled. Um, we had talked about two different dates, uh, at, at least uh, at, at, with the council office, uh, one being um, April the 28th, which I believe is that Thursday of, of um, the end of April. As a potential additional meeting date, we'd also talked about May 2nd, um, which I believe would be when, we, when, when the administration would be hoping for us to uh, approve a, a, a term sheet <clears throat> or a, a, an agreement. So negotiate yeah to move into negotiation so um, both have their um, strengths and weaknesses I believe as, as dates you know not being a Monday is a, is a weakness I suppose for for all of our schedules and um, the way we uh, go about our, our lives but also uh, wanting to have enough time before the second um, to really be able to change or adjust anything that we feel like really ought to be changed or adjusted the 28th of April or the 2nd of May um, as potential, potential additional committee of the whole meeting dates. Were there any comments? Um, I ought to advocate for the 28th just because it's kind of nice having, you know, not having that time pressure running up against the council meeting like we are right now. But we've got 15 minutes, we'll get there. Yep. But, but I think that'd just be nice to sit, kind of chat through some of this. If we have to go over, we have to go over. I, that, that, that's just nice to kind of have those less pressure discussions. Okay. And I'm free. I don't know about you guys. Oh, well, um, Council Member Keppel. Well, um, you know, I, I'm in favor of, of doing the Thursday one just on the off chance that I have more questions. Um, but also that does give us more, more time for those conversations and it also gives the administration time if we do have that final feedback, we can come back on Monday, review, hopefully refer to, you know, council that night so we're not up against the clock. And I just wanted to go back to the administration on that date as well uh, to make sure. I know we, um, I thought maybe the, the second would be more convenient because it's our usual Monday night, but I did want to open it up to my colleagues and see what, what people were open to. I'm looking at you, Sean, for the moment, but, but uh, yeah, I, perhaps I should quickly look to the mayor as well. I mean, Thursday, we, have, we do have our Lakewood Heritage Advisory Board meeting, but they can, they're, they can, they're self-sufficient too. They don't necessarily have to have a staff member there. Mm -hmm. Right now, I am their designated staff person given kind of just the 
transition point we are in our in the planning department. But I mean, either date can work for from our standpoint. May second was a was a preferred date, just given that. But sure, uh, we can we can make either date work. Okay, I appreciate that, Mayor. Same as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sure. Councilman Bullock. I, I I agree with what Councilwoman Keppel remarked, which is give yourself and and Councilman Rader, I think yourself ample time on Thursday plan to reserve May 2nd as a work session for any work that needs to be done. Sure. And then, you know, we can always and use the time differently. If absolutely. And, and I should add that that Monday meeting um, is the 24th, I think. Um, yeah, 25th. Fifth. Fifth, thank you. Um, it was my understanding there would be no math. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, that the... the the, the, the 25th, um, we could stay as long as we need to to get things done as well, um, perhaps to avoid the need for a 28th uh, meeting. In, uh, just from the from the developer side, uh, Mr. Sobchak does have a conflict that evening, so any... On the 28th? On the, on the 28th, so okay. if there's any, I'd like to answer all of any financial questions on the 25th. Since Absolutely since fair, yeah. Okay. I, I think on the 25th we'll do everything we can to cover anything we would need, okay. would need you for. Um, Again, perhaps we don't need the 28th, but we just wanted to make sure we had all our options available and didn't feel um, up against it time-wise um, as a council uh, to be able to really deliberate on this properly. Okay. Alex, anything else? On yeah, the timing? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and, and just, um, I think it's helpful to, to remind us all of kind of where, where we're at in the process, which is to say that, you know, this, this resolution before us is like for them to negotiate, right, with the developer further. Now, ultimately the term sheet you know, it's non-binding, but it kind of outlines the rubrics of what we're talking about. So just so the public's aware, too, I mean, what, what we're actually voting to approve and the administration, I believe, by May 2nd wants us to do so, which we can or cannot, depending on what we decide to do as a body. Um, but that just gets them, and then they come back to us with an actual development agreement. So uh, it's, a, it's a step in the process that enables public input, enables council input. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's not the agreement. It's you're on the right path. So... Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I, I need to talk to my boss. We'll have extra child care that night, but uh, we'll, we'll get there. I'll check with my daughter. <laughs> Mr. Chair, quick. Councilman Bullock. Bullock. Thank you. Um, I think Councilman Baker makes a good point. So just mechanically in terms of what council's Babies. deliberating upon and in the form of. Um, so we're considering the uh, term sheet and the approvals surrounding the term sheet. I, I think it's constructive to the degree possible for city council on behalf of the public with whom we all represent to uh, express some level of, of indication where our, our judgment is, our, our thoughts are. And so, um, you know, I had a sidebar with the planning director uh, recently about, you know, okay, what does council think about this or that? Um, um, it, it's, it's probably a constructive step for us to work towards expressing whatever that is. And it may not be 100% clarity on all points, but if city council has a strong uh, view of, of this or that facet, my understanding is it's, it's, it's not only constructive, but it's our, it's our job to do that. So that when you're proceeding forward with all the intensive work and some of the soft costs involved uh, with doing legal negotiations or renderings and designs and drawings, et cetera, um, it's not, you know, misaligned, and so we're not wasting anybody's time. So I do think it makes sense for us to be in intensive work mode, get as much of a, a consensus around whatever we're clear about at the front of the process. Does that work from everyone's point of view? I mean, is that fair characterization? It's up to council how you'd like to proceed and any any feedback direction you give us as, as we start to go move on to those next steps and get in front of our boards and commissions. Also then keep continuing to double back with city council while that is going on um, would be would be beneficial. Um, I did have a conversation with uh, Assistant Chief Law Director uh, Jen Swallow because she helps us manage those boards and commissions and what she suggested is that um, if, there are, if there is specific feedback you'd like to, to leave with us as we, assuming we're going to get to, to uh, an approval on the negotiation, uh, is to do that through your committee report. Um, the term sheet's already been executed, so the term sheet is what the term sheet is. It's a, it's a list of markers that we're going we're gonna to hit when we, when we talk about the development agreement. 
So if you have some additional markers you want us to consider as we go into that development agreement, put that in your committee report and we'll hold that and, and carry that forward to, to our boards and commissions and with the developer as we move, we move into those next spaces. Great, yeah, that makes sense. And, and I should add, my colleagues and I are all welcome to show up at some of these boards and commissions to uh, chime in personally. I, I know I've done that before when it's been something pertinent to a Ward 3 or whatever the case may be, and we should all feel welcome to, to, to do the same, to be a part of those uh, discussions. We do have at least four uh, signed up for public comment. I want to make sure we get to those. Before we do, we have one more question from uh, Councilman Schachner, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you. I know. Surprise, surprise. Okay. So last time we talked about the garden apartments and the two um, for sale lots that are next to the garden apartments on Bell. I seem to recall in our conversation the reason for the two residential was because it transitions into the community a bit because it's surrounded by other residential, but it appears maybe it's just the way it's drawn. On Marlowe, you have garden apartments abutting single family residential. So what is the barrier to, instead of having two for sale lots, just continuing the garden apartments along those two lots? I guess when you, there's really no barrier. Um, it was just trying to accomplish some for sale component. Um, so from, I guess, we'd be happy to extend that building further south. Um, we could throw that in the committee report if nobody else is upset about it. Yeah, uh, if I could, Mr. Chair. Um, I think that just rounded off the end of the site. You can see where the garden level, um, the two single family homes, they back up to each other, so neighbors. Also, uh, I'm sure you hear this a lot of times, I hear it from the community, is the lack of additional single family homes. So it was an opportunity to at least provide a couple single family homes, but I think, um, as was mentioned, it's uh, it's up for discussion. It could play out through the boards and commissions. Um, I know I personally like the idea of a couple single family homes. I don't transitions in the neighborhood well, um, but I think we can see how that plays out in boards and commissions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you all. Okay, with that, we're, we're going to move on to public comment. Um, again, we have four signed up uh, on my sheet. There may have been an additional uh, person that signed up since. Then, but our first public comment comes from Mark Stockman. Hi. Good, e good evening, uh, Mark Stockman, 1053 Maple Cliff. Um, I'm excited this project is moving forward. I'm glad it's back on track, and I, I really think it'll, it'll, you know, it's got a lot of potential. I am here, however, to echo the concerns I heard from people on council that about uh, preservation of the of the Curtis Block. Um, I'm not blind to the, to the constraints that this project has, and I, told, I, I understand that it's much easier to, to develop retail space that's open and modern and, and all of that, but I'd like to remind council that in 2015, um, I was the chair of the Lakewood Planning Commission. Uh, the, we were in the midst of designating various buildings within the city of Lakewood as historic structures. Uh, the city came to us, the Planning Commission, and asked that this building be designated a historic building. Uh, that was partially out of just a um, trying to lead by example, trying to uh, do as I say and not as I do. Uh, we had had a lot of pushback from various building owners when their properties were designated as a, as a historic property. And it was, it was really an effort by the city to, to show that, this, that they value historic preservation and as it's important to them. And I just feel it would be somewhat almost hypocritical and embarrassing for the city to, to backslide from that stance that they took in 2015. I understand that, the, you know, that there's constraints and, and economic constraints and physical constraints, but I really think that the city has to find a way, it has to be imperative to be able to, to hold this building and, and keep it preserved. And you know, a, uh, just preserving the facade is really just not, a, you know, we only designated the exterior of the building 
as historic because that's all the ordinance allows us to do. But that doesn't mean that the rest of the building is not uh, worthy of preservation. It also doesn't mean that the, the scale of the building, the massing, how it sits within the city is not important as well. So I really think that the city needs to do everything they can to find a way to keep, the, keep and restore and preserve uh, the Curtis block. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Heather Rudge. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Heather Rudge, 13926 Clifton Boulevard. <clears throat> um, I just want to cover a couple things, and I may have heard you incorrectly, but I think you said that the difference between keeping the Curtis Black um, with Keeping the Curtis Block would give you approximately 8,000 square feet of retail space versus 17,000 because of how the new building would be configured with the Curtis Block. Is that correct? The, the largest retail space is 17,000. In and that's the Curtis Block and what's behind it. In building one, that ground floor would all be 17,000. Okay. And then you mentioned you're in preliminary talks with, is it, a, I'm assuming it's a national retailer. I don't know that. You can correct me if my assumption is wrong. But um, I would question why we would, as a community, as a city, as city council, would allow a potential retailer who could be out of business in 24 months or five years. Why would we let a potential retail tenant dictate what of our history we, we keep and we preserve. It, it makes absolutely no sense to me. And somebody needs to explain that to me. As a taxpayer, I don't want to subsidize one nickel in a development that throws away our built environment and the history of our community. We have said that this building is important. It's landmarked. There was huge support when we landmarked it. So to, to subsidize the demolition or partial demolition of a historic landmark building to satisfy a retailer who's coming in from out of state, out of, I don't know, you can correct me, is insane. I'm outraged that that would even be considered as a taxpayer and somebody who cares about this community who has lived here for 30 years. So somebody needs to explain that to me if that's the road we go down. It, it's just, it's unacceptable. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that in 20, in I have December 22nd, 2020, and uh, December 17th, 2020, we had a contractor and an architect, preservation architect, go through the Curtis Block with us, with the structural engineer, who wrote a report um, for the last administration. Um, the report is dated 2016. This is structural engineer walked the building with us, with the contractor and the architect, and we got cost per square foot for rehab. This $7 million figure that's out there, sorry, I don't, it's baloney. And that is what people hear. It's seven million, it's two million. But I don't know where you're getting your pricing, and it seems to me it's a convenient price to to justify the demolition of the Curtis Block. So I said last week that we have been kept, that the preservation community has been kept at arm's length on this building. Let us go into the building and update our numbers with people who know what they're doing. I'm not saying the Castro doesn't know what they're doing, but this is too big of an important deal to just take a $7 million number and throw a building away because it's $7 million. I mean, I work on projects every day and they're a lot more complicated than this, and they don't cost $7 million. The other, and then the final thing I want to say is, I talked to some developers, the, some of my clients, and I told them about this deal, and I said, and they're selling three floors of, a new, of new construction to a, a private company. And they're like, well, how did that, that's a sweet deal. How does that work? How do they have a, how do they have a gap? So I just, those are questions that need to be answered, and I'm going to be here every week until somebody wakes up and, and sees that this is a, is, a, is a bad deal. Thank you. Thank you. Next up for public comment is Paula Reed.
Paula Reed, 1208 Manor Park. Um, thank you, first of all, council members, for your thoughtful questions and your willingness to really consider this project that is so important for Lakewood for the future. Um, I just want to encourage you to continue to ask those questions. I have had a long relationship with the Curtis Block starting back in about 2009 when it just became vacated and on the behalf of the Downtown Lakewood Merchants Association um, did programming in the windows, was in and out of that building, saw it deteriorate over the years, tried to be the alarm for that, but no one was paying attention. Um, it is a wonderful building if it were put back into the shape uh, that it could be. The apartment that's on the corner of Marlowe and Detroit is glorious with a Murphy bed. There's beautiful woodwork up there. I don't know what its current condition is, but um, the last time I was in the building was probably 2019, so I haven't seen where it is. But there was nothing early on that wasn't fixable. Um, it's an important building. We are going to lose every time when we try to become Westlake. We need to make sure that we keep what's important about Lakewood and our streetcar suburb. And Heather mentioned that the Curtis Block is landmarked, and so did Mark. Um, the whole downtown district is now as a streetcar suburb. So we want to make sure that we maintain the character, which is what Lakewood offers to people that's different. That's why they come here. Thank you. Thank you. And our final public comment, at least that I know of, is uh, Richard Sika. Rick Sika, 1519 West Clinton Boulevard. Um, I'm going to sort of be all over the site. Um, the three-story walk-up buildings. We're a community that says, that talks constantly about being accessible and walkable. And I heard tonight say that the three-story buildings aren't going to have an elevator. You know, people's health conditions change, or you break a leg, or you blow out an Achilles tendon. You're out of your home, then, is what that means. And I just, I'll add an expense, but I think every building in that site needs to have an elevator. The plaza. So it was an interesting conversation about whether it should be in the middle or at the corner. And I do think that the way the elevations look, it is asking as if you need an additional invitation to go into that slot between the buildings because what's going to front out there are either doors to retailers or outdoor patios or an office building entrance. So if you're not there for one of those purposes, are you really going to think that you're comfortable just because you'd like to sit outside in the warm weather for 20 minutes, just ignore what's going on outside and uh, in the summer? And the other thing is we're all guessing about the activity at the uh, clinic facility and the drop-off. There needs to be a survey done. Maybe the clinic already col collects all of this and they know every drop-off that happens there. They know every ambulance that comes in there, time-wise is what I mean, and do that over 24 hours. Or somebody needs to sit out there, like a city employee, God knows I did enough parking studies and other things when I was at the County Planning Commission, and you need to just be there and watch and count. Because it may not be an issue. That, was, that point was raised. It may not be an issue as to what's happening over there, because maybe it's just mostly 8 to 6, and it's just folks dropping off other folks, and that's all. I mean, I get the comments from way back with the poor, unfortunate residents on Marlowe who really had to see ambulances being unloaded until there was screening done to, to, for them, but this may be different. Um, which then leads me to the garage. And am I right that the spots that the clinic staff are using now are way back at the south end, south of the whole? Okay, I'm getting, okay. Um, how many of those spots are being used? How many people are there? Same thing. Do we need a survey to know whether, are there 70 people there a day? Are there 35 people a day? That needs to be looked at over a couple of days, once an hour, see what that kind of usage is. 
because if we don't need all of those spaces, that's spaces that don't need to be built. And I'm going to just ignore kind of what the legal language is with the agreement with the clinic because that's just something that the previous administration has another mess that they've left us to deal with it's related to the hospital. There is an underutilized garage on the north side of Bell. I have to say I'm not sure who owns it at the moment, but there's space there. And I had also heard that the lease agreement somewhere uses the word adjacent. Well, that's an interesting word because adjacent doesn't necessarily, doesn't mean abutting or contiguous. So even if the spots end up in the garage, someone has to cross the street to get to work. So whether you cross the street east-west or you cross the street north-south across Detroit, that could be construed as the same thing. The other thing that I think is going to keep happening if those spaces end up in the garage on Bell is that, well, as I'm driving through Lakewood and Cleveland, what I call human squirrels, the folks who don't use the crosswalks and don't go to the lights and just decide to dash across seven lanes at Clifton in front of traffic, um, that's going to continue to happen there. And that's a bell is a busy street. And having people leave a, and enter a parking garage mid-block to get to the parking lot of the clinic, sorry, you guys are seeing that in reverse, you know, you could regulate all of that pedestrian traffic right there at a signal on Detroit. So I really think there ought to be serious attention paid to seeing about whether adjacent and spaces can be done on the north side of Detroit. Um, I think the spaces in the garage need to be metered, the public spaces, because otherwise office workers during the day and residents at night are going to figure out, I can get a free spot for 12 or 16 hours in the garage for all my uses. So that needs to be, that's down the road, but that all needs to be sorted through. Um, finally, on the Curtis block. Um, you know, we were said that we didn't have a, uh, a front door. The front door is right there. It's the four vintage buildings right at the, right at the intersection. And that's the best front door we have. And I'll just, uh, I think there are ways to move the apartments and some of the retail around that would be lost if not um, allocated to that spot. And I'll let that go for the next meeting because I ran out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for all the public commenters and members of the public who joined us this evening. Um, without any further business, Mr. We'll Chair, continue this discussion. I just we want to adjourn in a second two, after the mayor says something. Yeah, two quick comments. I do want to just comment real quick on the uh, Cleveland Clinic. I have the, a copy of the master agreement uh, on my computer right here, which was si signed December 11, 2018. And it says uh, that we need to lease uh, 75 automobile parking spaces as identified as the existing emergency department parking lot on the east side of Bell Avenue. So it's very specific on the location. I will add that we've had preliminary discussions about see if we can talk with Cleveland Clinic to see if there's any wiggle room on that. We've had internal conversations about that other parking lot you've discussed that isn't used. That is something that we're going to work through through the summer months, but it is pretty ironclad in that agreement. And I also just want to talk uh, just for a second about the Curtis Block because it is an important building and it is historic and I appreciate that and I talk about preserving buildings in our community whenever possible. Um, and we've done that. We've done a lot of adaptive reuse projects. And every time Sean and I talk, we talk about adaptive reuse, adaptive reuse. I really believe what makes Lakewood special is our historic character. What I'm trying to lay out and what I think Casto has as well, we've gone through the financial exercises backwards and forwards, and we cannot find a path forward in maintaining the Curtis block. And that's really difficult for me to say, but that's the reality. And, and through this process, we're still going to look at there are options, but that $7 million figure on top of the loss of residential units is substantial. It's more than we have in the hospital fund. And so when we talk about city council, we talk about public subsidy, we're talking an astronomical public subsidy if that was even to be contemplated. So what I will say is we'll continue to explore it, but please at least appreciate that it's, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to keep the whole uh, uh, Curtis block. And what we've done is at least trying to keep the character, the character with just the facade save, what keeps that corner that we heard about through the public process was what's really important is the outside corner. And so uh, we're hoping to, to, to you know, do the best we can in that area. So I just want to um, uh, comment on that, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Uh, 
with that and there being no further business of, of the uh, committee and since we're going to continue this discussion in a week, uh, we are adjourned. We'll start up uh, full council in about five minutes.